So to get comfortable using the pump equation, we're going to take this video to talk about the different components in this formula. So let's start with a little bit of context about when we talk about the output of this equation, the, the kWh, what that means. Well, we're talking about the, the site energy used by this pumping system that's going to be registered at the electric meter. So if you're looking about the economics of your pumping system and you want to get to how much it costs or how much energy it uses to run a particular system at a certain set of conditions, that's what's going to be seen at your utility meter. But it's important to realize that we can use this pump equation to not just look at the pumping system as a whole, but if we have a, a certain component in our system, if we wanted to look at the energy associated with a very specific pressure drop associated with some valve or some set of piping, we could plug those numbers into this equation too to understand what the pump energy associated with those components would be. So as we'll keep reiterating, pump and head are really the key operating parameters of a pumping system, and those are direct inputs into this equation. So flow is, is fairly intuitive, that's the GPM or gallons per minute, but head is a little bit less intuitive, and we've been using that term now, so let's take a pause and kind of delve into what that means. So head in this context refers to a pressure, a water hydraulic pressure. And just a thought experiment to see where that comes from. Let's say you're in your garage and you built a glass column that's a perfect square of one inch by one inch on each side. So you have a surface area or a cross-sectional area of one square inch, and let's say you've measured out a perfect pound of water with your, with your hypothetical scale, and you dump that water into this glass column. So now you have one pound of water in this square inch column. Well, if you slap a gauge at the bottom of this, you should read one pound per square inch of gauge pressure. So we use the term gauge to qualify PSI because there's always a certain amount of atmospheric pressure. So the air is crushing down on this water. If you're at sea level, it's about 15 PSI. So the gauge ignores that, and that's why we, we say one PSI G, or pound per square inch of gauge pressure. Now you take your perfect measuring tape and you measure up this column of water, you're going to get 2.31 feet at these ideal conditions. So that's really the source of this conversion that we're going to use. You may see in the field a gauge across a pump or within your pumping system, and if you need to convert that to feet of water column, which is going to be, we're going to see in industry practice and convenient to talk about pump performance in terms of feet of water column, you're going to want to remember this conversion, that one PSIG corresponds to 2.31 feet of water column. The pump equation also has this SG, or standard gravity, term. And this is going to be a factor for how much different the density of fluid is in your system relative to this ideal water. So water has an SG of 1. Ethylene glycol, as you can see, has a very slightly different SG. So probably not enough to have any meaningful change in your pump energy equation, but good to note as you vary from those typical HVAC hydronic conditions about how we can still use this equation, but, but how we may need to modify it a little bit. So there's a slew of efficiency terms in there, and we're going to want to make sure to put good numbers into that so we can get good numbers out with our kWh. So let's look at what that correlates to. Well, if you're sitting in your mechanical room and you can kind of envision right in front of you looking at the pump, the motor behind VFD on the, on the wall, so each of those components is going to have its own set of built-in inefficiencies. So let's kind of start at the discharge of the pump and work backwards. So we can use this term water horsepower to think about the actual amount of power that gets converted to fluid to move it at the pressure and the GPM required by your system. But a centrifugal pump is going to have certain inherent losses associated with it that we have to account for. So if we look at a kind of cross-section of a pump, consider that we're a water molecule traveling through the eye of the impeller, and then based on the components of acceleration, we're getting flung to the edge of the pump casing. When we crash into that, the wall of the volume chamber, there's going to be an acceleration loss, and that loss corresponds to a certain degree of inefficiency in the pump. You're accelerating that water, you're flinging it, but then you're crashing it into a wall. So necessarily, there's some loss there. As that water then discharges towards the outlet of the pump, depending on the size of the gap between your impeller 
and your volume chamber, you may have a certain amount of leakage there that's going to correspond to an additional inefficiency. So when you combine those together, you need to account for the actual horsepower that needs to be supplied to the pump in excess of what the water horsepower would be. And we call that quantity brake horsepower. And one quaint way that you can remember that is if you were to have to stop the spinning drive shaft coming from the motor going to the pump, that amount of power it takes to stop it is going to be the brake horsepower. And then the difference between the brake and the water horsepower is going to correlate to the actual efficiency of the pump. So some typical numbers you'll see in the pump curves we're going to look at might be 65, 70, 75 percent efficient, but it really is going to depend on how that pump is running, how the pump was sized, and where on the pump curve it is. And we'll take a look at that in one of our next videos. And the motor is going to have its own set of inefficiency. So you have mechanical losses from friction in the bearings with the spinning pieces. You have electrical losses because you have wiring in the windings and throughout the motor that are going to have those IR squared resistive base losses. And that's going to require an additional amount of energy that needs to be supplied as, in this case, we'll say motor horsepower to be able to provide the brake horsepower that we need. Also keep in mind that with the induction motors that drive these pump systems, that the further away we get from full load, we start to see the further away we can get from the rated efficiency of that motor. So it's it can be pretty minimal with a, a medium to large size pump motor until you get to about below 50%. So keep in mind that if you're going to be running your pump frequently below that full load, that you're going to start to see these efficiency drops commensurate with the motor size that you're using. And if you have a variable frequency driver, VFD, that's going to have its own set of inefficiencies. It's not going to be as big as these other components, but you know, keep in mind it is a a piece of electronics that's getting powered and when you see the vent on the side of this VFD cabinet that's that's indicative of this loss this heat loss that comes off of these components so it may only be a couple percentage points but keep in mind for the not only the pump energy equation but if you're thinking about installing a VFD in your system you want to make sure that the economics of those bear out and that you're going to be varying or trimming the operation of your system enough to justify those couple percentage drops in efficiency So that's kind of the big shoot and match for the energy that we need to provide to the water versus the energy that our electric meter may see. So we, so we want to be able to account for all those upstream inefficiencies to understand what it would actually cost us in energy and dollars at the utility meter for, the, for a particular set of pumping system conditions. So there's a few constants that we'll cover real briefly. The first one is 39.56. We want to know where that came from so that we feel comfortable using it. So it's actually a conversion between GPM and foot of water column to horsepower. So it's a way for us to directly plug in those key operating parameters into the pump equation. And the way we get there is with a couple conversions. First one being a volumetric conversion. So one gallon corresponding to 0.134 cubic feet. A conversion accounting for the amount of weight in one cubic foot of water. Uh, time conversion so that we can use GPM and then this power conversion between foot-pounds per hour to horsepower. The second power conversion is a little simpler it's just a straight conversion between horsepower to kW which is 0.746. And then the last component it could be the most critical and it can be the hardest to hammer down which is the amount of hours that that pumping system runs to get to an annual KWH. So maybe at a preliminary stage you can assume it, say if it's an office, depending on what you think the operating schedule is, it might run between 2,000 and 3,000 hours per year. But we don't really know walking up to a system if the pump is going to be scheduled with the building. It could be to some degree on demand if it is, let's say, having some offset with when a boiler or a chiller shuts down, it may run for 10 or 15 minutes after that. If it, You may think that it's scheduled with the building, but it may operate 24-7 or on some different sequence of operation. So a good practice is to eventually use an automation system or use a portable data logger that you can slap 
onto the motor to determine how often that system is running. Another tricky part is if you have a variable speed system, you want to know what speed it's running and how many hours it runs at those different speeds, maybe in a couple blocks. So you can chunk up what the KWH is associated with the different speeds and when you think it runs at those. And we'll look at that as we start getting into some more of the RCX specific skills that you need to be able to assess that kind of performance. But for now, we're going to move on to pumping distribution and looking at some of the components that make up a typical hydronic system.